Welcome into The Verge, a show which covers the Baltimore Orioles minor leagues. The Verge is part of BSL Radio. Baltimore Sports and Life is dedicated to analysis and discussion on the Orioles, Baltimore Ravens, and the University of Maryland. The site has a team of writers providing coverage of those teams and houses live streaming content weekly. Join the conversations at the message board, like BSL on Facebook, and follow BSL on Twitter. On Twitter. Want to make a podcast? Spotify's got a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere and even earn money, all in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters, and here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer, so no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available on Spotify. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free with no catch. Ever since we discovered Spotify for Podcasters, we feel like having options like video podcasts and Q&A lets us be more creative on another level. I highly recommend you give it a try. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com slash podcasters to get started. Welcome to On the Verge. This is Zach Spedden's win as always by Bob Phelan and Nick Stevens. And on tonight's episode, we check in with the spring training update, including some of the storylines that we're following, as well as some of the players who've impressed us with their performances in camp thus far. We're also going to talk about Bob's latest piece over at BaltimoreSportsAndLife.com, where he interviewed Orioles outfield prospect John Rhodes. And we're going to wrap up with a survey from our Patreon group, who shared some interesting opinions about the upcoming 2022 season. Uh, And that's all on tonight's episode, but we'll start with spring training. And before the show, the three of us kind of – talked about what we really see as the big storylines at this point in camp. And really down to just two key areas where there seems to be position battles going on. One of them is the infield, and the other is the rotation spots three through five when you get past John Means and Jordan Lyles. The infield, we've seen Brandon Hyde shuffle some players around with the exception of first base, where Ryan Malcastle appears locked in for that job. And right now we're looking at a group that includes Ramon Arias, Jorge Mateo, um, Chris Owings, and Kelvin Gutierrez battling it out for spots along with Rugnet Odor. So, Nick, I'll start with you. It's been interesting to see the way the Orioles have handled this, moving the players around maybe even a little bit more than we expected um, at the start of camp. What are your thoughts on that, and how do you see this shaking out over the last 10 days or so of spring training? That's a really good question. Um, I feel like... I have more confidence filling out my NCAA bracket than I do trying to answer this question of who's going to be the starting infield on opening day. Um, Like there's just so many different combinations the Orioles can go with and you see it every day in these spring training games. And I think when the season starts, that's going to continue Uh, every day. It's going to be something different or every couple of days is going to be something different. It's kind of writing matchups, writing the hot hand, Um, you know, sending Jemai Jones and Ryland Bannon down the other day. I think that, pretty much cleared up the picture there. Uh, those guys are going to try to get regular at bats in AAA. They're going to roll with the veterans who are out of options. Um, not as exciting, but, you know, I, I get it. Uh, Chris Owens, you know, we were talking about him before the before we hopped on. Um, nothing special. He's a veteran body, but like we were saying, he can play every position around the infield. So we know the Orioles are really valuing that. Um, I don't think Odor is going to be this lightning in the bottle signing that some Orioles fans are probably hoping for. Like he's, he's just not good. I mean, it's almost a thousand big league games and his career on base percentage is 289, a 234 hitter and 86 WRC plus. Um, I'd rather watch Chris Owens bounce around the infield than watch Odor to be completely honest. Uh, I, I think again, I'm the Kelvin Gutierrez Stan. I'm going to play that role here. I think he's the lock at third base. Ramon Arias at short. And then if you're not going to add anybody else, maybe Jorge Mateo at second base or Ramon Arias at second, Jorge Mateo at shortstop. And then honestly hope Jones, Bannon, Baver, or someone else forces their way up uh, soon. Yeah. It's not going to, it's going to be another year where the infield is like, okay, who's, who's got the hot week in AAA? Who can we claim like, uh, you know, go on Twitter and, and want them to bring them up and, and just razz on Mike Elias all day uh, until he does. It's going to be like that in the beginning of the year, but, I do think Ramon Urias, Urias has uh, had an incredible spring, picking up where he left off at the end of last year. So 
I think he's a lock at shortstop. You see Mateo played shortstop today. He made he just doesn't look smooth out there. It doesn't look great. Uh, he probably has more range in Urias, but I feel like Ramon is going to be a little more consistent and steady Eddie out there, and he'll give you that bet. Mateo, I do think, is a lock for the roster, but I just I, I think I could see him more moving around all over the place, getting fairly regular at bats, but second base, shortstop, third base, left field, who knows. And like you said, I think it's between Kelvin Gutierrez, Rugnet Odor, and Chris Owings for like that final spot or two. I think one of Gutierrez or Odor is probably going to be cut because I think Owings has shown enough to provide value for this team where he can he, he can hit a little bit. He can field his position all over the place, seven different spots. So he's like we were saying before the show started, Pat Valeka with a better glove but can play like twice as many positions, and uh, we know Elias loves that. And I, Gutierrez, great glove for sure. I just – even though he's had a pretty good spring, he had a great winter ball – I just don't think the bat's going to be there. And and same with Odor. I mean, yeah, he might hit you 20 home runs if you give him 500 plate appearances, but do we want to do that? I do not. So, yeah, I, I, I don't know who I'd prefer to see cut between the two, but I'm hoping one of those is uh, not on the opening day roster. I've kind of fallen back on Gutierrez's defense is the reason why I think he's going to make the roster because if he doesn't play third, then who's going to play third? But it does feel like the Orioles might be willing to try some different options, knowing that the, all, those three infield spots, other than first base, and I think wherever Ramon Arias settles in at some point, are going to be in flux for most of the year. So maybe the Orioles decide now, if they don't really see Gutierrez as part of their long-term plans, they give Chris Owings a shot there. Um, Rylan Bannon hit really well before he went down to Norfolk. But perhaps he needs more time there, like a player we're going to talk about a little bit later on tonight. But you look at him, Demai Jones, and Taryn Vavra, and if you want to look a little bit further down, maybe Joey Ortiz and Jordan Westberg as players that could be solutions for the Orioles later this year. But it's still interesting to look at this group now and figure out how they're going to get to that point. You mentioned the, the Mateo era today, and that was with Kyle Bradish on the mound. And he forced Bradish to work a little harder. It was really great. For, on Bradish's end to see bases loaded, two outs. He's going up against MLB regulars, and he was able to get out, out of that inning with no damage. But like, I don't want to see that expounded over and over again as the season goes along with this terrible defense behind him. And I feel like that's what we're going to get here, unfortunately. But like, if there is one bright spot, though, like to try to put a positive spin on this, like it's Ramon Arias, and like. He was hanging around. If you go back to Fangraph's list, he was hanging around. He was with the Cardinals, I believe, before the Orioles at some point. But I think Cardinals list and the Orioles list the last couple of years, like Eric Longenhagen and the team over at Fangraph's kept him on the back end of those lists for the last couple of years. And I think we're starting to see why. And I think that was a really fantastic find and good pickup to see what he's turned into. And if he can hit like he did last year and into the spring training, Orioles got themselves a really good piece there. So that's you got half the infield down at least. Yeah, that was a great find for sure by Elias there, picking him off of waivers. I mean, the kid can hit. He's he's not the best fielder in the world, but he's not going to make the errors, I don't think, as often as Mateo would, you know, trying to make the flashy play. But, yeah, I think the thing is, though, you got Taron Vavra, like like uh, Zach said, Taron Vavra, Jemai Jones, Ryland Bannon, these guys I feel like are going to be, you know, closer than ever in AAA. And if they're performing – and someone at the major league level like a Gutierrez or Odor is not, I don't think it's going to be this long drawn out thing like it was last year where they call the young guy up and, uh, and don't cut bait with the old guy or whatever, like Valeka just sticking around forever. I feel like if Vavra's at AAA and he's performing and it's May and Odor's batting 190 with six home runs, then they'll, they'll, they'll flip that switch there. And, uh, I just I think the infield's just going to progressively get better and better and better from month to month over the next two years. Yeah, I agree, and I think that regardless of who makes the opening day roster out of Odor, um, Owings, Gutierrez, and perhaps Mateo, they're going to be on a short lease. I don't think there's going to be a lot of waiting around to see oh if they can hit. As long as you have players like Demai Jones, Taron Vavra, and Ryland Banning hitting down at AAA and are healthy. You're talking about the prospects too. I think last year was just this really, it was weird timing and a weird year in terms of some of these prospects because they didn't play in 2020. And, you know, 
they didn't have that experience. And so, yeah, you didn't want to bring Jemai Jones up. You didn't want to bring, well, Ryland Bain was hurt, so that's a different story. But I just felt like it was a weird year for the prospects. Well, now they've got a full year under their belt. They've got good spring training under their belt. Uh, they've got, the, you know, the minor leaguers weren't locked out. So they've been at these camps all winter with the coaching staff. They've been in Sarasota. Uh, so I, I do agree that this year, maybe the, the triggers pulled a little bit quicker with some of these guys. But at the same time, it's it's a group we're looking at with Jones and Bannon that, you know, how long of a leash do they have? Because they haven't exactly lit the world on fire over the last couple of years. So, But, yeah, we'll see how it all shakes out. But it's definitely going to be a, a piecemeal process here. Yeah, and the thing with Owings, why I'm pretty much con- considering him a lock at this point is, is that defensive standpoint. Like you said, you don't want guys making errors out there, extending innings for these young pitchers, especially after the year they had to go through last year. So Owings, I mean, he's, he's pretty good with the glove all over the place. So if you have Urias at short, uh, Owings at second, and Gutierrez at third, that's pretty solid defense considering the guys that you have. It might not you know give you a bunch of offense at the plate, but you got other guys who could do that, that in the meantime. That was loud. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so I think, you know, you want to keep that defense tight until you might be able to go along with slightly worse defense for more offense when it's a prospect who's continuing to improve. But when it's just these old veterans that are, uh, you know, not going to really change much from who they are now, then I think you want to go more defense than offense. Those are good points. And we'll move on now to the discussion about the starting rotation. We've had a few pitchers option now from the top prospects that really didn't come into camp as, you know, viable rotation candidates like Grayson Rodriguez and DL Hall two pitchers like Alexander Wells, who seemed like they were in the mix for a rotation spot. Kyle Bradis had an audition on Monday, which is when we're recording this podcast against the Phillies where he looked excellent, but he was option right after that outing confirming what we kind of have suspected for a while, which is that, he's going to go back to AAA for at least a little bit more seasoning. So for right now, it looks like the rotation spots beyond John Means and Jordan Lyles are down to just a few key players. I want to start with one of them because he did just pitch here on Monday, and that's Dean Kramer. Uh, this is someone who we've talked about a lot as you know needing to get back on track after a rough 2021 where he really struggled both at the majors and at AAA. And not to take too much away from one outing, but it seemed like on Monday we sort of saw the best and worst of Dean Kramer uh, in some respects. So, Bob, looking at this field as a whole right now, where do you see Kramer fitting in? Honestly, I see him making the rotation in the, either in the four or five spot at this point. I mean, he's getting the innings that are going to be required to at least go four or five to start the year. His stuff actually looks pretty good. Like he's throwing some nasty pitches. He had a change up that had like a 26 inch drop or something. His his curveball looks good. His fastball's got some zip to it in 90s with with movement. The cutter he just is so in love with that he's throwing it over and over and over again. And then people read it and, and they crush it for a home run like they did twice. But I mean, it was against real legit hitters at a Phillies lineup that's going to be like, you know, one of the best in the National League. And I think I saw that they. The second home run, the Shorber one, was like a 170 um, expected batting average. So maybe that one was a little bit fluky, but stuff looks good. It seems like he has more confidence than he did last year. So I feel like if he's going to get another chance in a rotation, it's going to be to start this season, and hopefully he can get that job and run with it. But I've been – you still see flashes, (laughs) plenty of flashes, of the uh, Dean Kramer of the last – season that was such a disappointment but he did strike out five or six guys and didn't walk anybody so i do think that you see a little bit of improvement and i think he's gonna get a shot to start the year yeah this this outing was and i'm glad i saw a few people on twitter after kramer's outing uh, say the same thing that if you watch the outing i think it was a lot better than what the box score says um for sure like yeah the two home runs not great. I mean, he left meatballs right there over the plate. I get that. Uh, you got to command that cutter better. And you, you're right. The Schwarber home run was only like three, barely 360 feet, like 150 expected batting average. I think I saw somebody was like, he's gave up two bombs today. He gave up one bomb to Castellanos because that's what he does. Uh, that Schwarber was a pop fly. Um, that was a Florida spring training home run. So I, I give him the benefit of the doubt there. But 
yeah, no walks, five strikeouts, three innings. Like I like that. Uh, the changeup was dancing. We know the curveball is good. Um, I think he just he looks better out there in the line. He looks more confident. Um, he's getting guys chasing. He's getting the whiffs. He, that's more important to me. Like those numbers. He's getting the whiffs, the swing and misses. He's not walking guys because walks were an issue last year, especially in AAA. He get hit a little bit and then just fall apart and crumble in those starts with Norfolk. He didn't do that today. He stayed in there, kept striking guys out. And he went up against a really good Philly lineup. So I enjoyed today's outing. His first outing I thought was okay as well. I just think he probably, if I had to bet, I'd say he probably starts in AAA because I want to see him on a regular, like can he go a month or a couple of weeks making good quality starts, a couple of good quality starts in a row with Norfolk because last season was was bad. It was it was really bad, especially in the major leagues. So I want to see him get that get stretched out and look good in AAA before he comes up. But like you mentioned, with all the guys being optioned today, I'm wondering if he does end up just kind of falling into that spot there. Well, Bob, I think that's a good point that you know he might be the guy they try out early in the year. I I, I kind of agree with Nick that you want to see a little bit of consistency and a consistent routine. But at the same time, with the way that things are falling, it does look like he has a good shot at getting there. The pitch that he threw the Castellano sit out was left right over the plate. Uh, you don't want to locate your cutter there against most hitters, let alone Nick Castellanos. But I actually thought the at-bat before that, when he walked Bryce Harper, even with the walk, he actually handled Harper pretty well. Didn't really give him anything that he could, you know, hit for hard contact. And if you got to walk the reigning NL MVP, you got to do it. But I actually didn't have a problem with his pitch sequence there. The curveball looks good today. And I think he's just got to, you know, I think it's going to be a matter of figuring out what is his best pitch mix and how is he going to work that cutter in? Because if he's not going to locate it, it's going to cause him a lot of problems, but it's still good to have there in the arsenal. Yeah. I mean, that Castellanos, I mean, it was middle, middle cut right into the barrel of the bat. I mean, I feel like his fat, he, I don't know why he's gone away from the fastball. It seems like he wants to throw the cutter more than the fastball. I feel like it should be at least be 50 50 to kind of mix up the, the view a little bit for the, from the hitters end. But yeah, I don't know if it's just something he's working on in spring, but then it was a similar thing last year. And then he threw the cutter so much in the regular season and it got lit up again. So hopefully, he just keeps working on it. And whether he starts at AAA or in the majors, I do think there's a chance he could bounce back a little bit this year. The only reason I think he's going to start in the majors is because I don't want Keegan Agan starting the regular season. And Bradish is optioned. Alex Wells, who I predicted would start in the rotation, is option. So, I mean, it could be Zach Lothar. It could be Bruce Zimmerman, of course, and Keegan Aiken, But Chris Ellis, maybe, but uh, I don't know. It's it's again just like the infield. It's going to be looking a little rough to begin the year, but then it'll slowly get better as as the year goes on. So the thing here, one guy you didn't mention that I'm coming around on is Tyler Wells, and I don't know. I don't know if we really talked about this too much last week on our prediction episode, but I'm kind of coming around the idea of using Tyler Wells as a starter. Somebody asked me last week, and I was like, "No, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Like keep him in the bullpen." But at the same time, like he didn't go into the lockout with it wasn't a situation where it's like, hey, the lockout's over, call up Wells and let him know we're thinking about using him as a starter. Like he went into the offseason with the plan in place to stretch him out. So, you know, if you pair him with Zach Lowther, if you bring up Alex Wells, maybe uh, if you pair him with another one of these young arms and piggyback these guys to help stretch them out, put your best guys up there. If Tyler Wells clearly has some of the best stuff uh, on this entire pitching staff at the major league level. I'm kind of – I'm on board now. Put him in the rotation because, yeah, I mean, who else are you going to use it? You want Jorge Lopez back in? Do you want Chris Ellis in that rotation? Like, let's put our best guys in the rotation right now. I don't hate the idea. I mean, he's looked good so far in the spring, and, yeah, he's got great stuff. And what's the worst case? It doesn't work out. You just shift him back to one inning stints, and he should be as good as he ever was. So, yeah, I'm down for that. I'd rather – again, I'd rather see him than Keegan Akins of the world in the starting rotation. So, I'm not – that. I think some of my reluctance in the past to put Wells in the rotation has sort of been the fear of this unknown. He was a starter in the twin system a few years ago. He had Tommy John surgery, then gets drafted out of the Rule 5 draft by the Orioles and comes back as a reliever. And like Nick said, if it's not broken, don't fix it. 
So my thought all along had been to keep him in the bullpen. And it's also because under this regime, we have not really seen that successful transition from bullpen to rotation. So you're not really sure, okay, is Tyler Wells the first guy that you really want to try this with? But this is someone who was developed as a starter by the Twins. And you have to wonder, had it not been for the injury and had it not been for the pandemic, um, would he have eventually made it to Minnesota? as a starter. I don't know, but it is something to consider. And here's some uh, good thought here from Sim Contribute, which is issue is how many innings Wells can go this year. I think you both touched on ways maybe you manage his workload a little bit early on, but I'll throw this out there. Maybe it's Chris Ellis or Jorge Lopez backing up Tyler Wells for the first month and a half. So if Tyler Wells is only on the mound for four innings a start, You've got someone that can go a little bit deeper into the game. Yeah, and I wonder if instead of turning him into a starter by stretching him out, if they're trying to turn him into the Garrett Whitlock two or three inning stint type of guy, and he could be like a, you know, the typical Rays pitcher that is like a Yarborough or Josh Fleming who's going to just, I don't know, maybe he'll start a game and, and just go one or two times through the lineup and then get switched out or come out in relief after someone has gone like two times through the lineup and try to extend the games into the back end of the bullpen that way. But, and maybe that's kind of a slow ramp up to have him be a starter next year. I don't know, but yeah, hopefully he can pitch more innings than he did last year. But I, I don't know if, if he starts the year in the rotation, I doubt he'll be able to pitch 150 to 180 innings. Yeah. And it's, it just makes too much sense though. I know we talked about this last year too. And I think, uh, it was Hyde or Elias. I can't remember who it was but there. It was probably Hyde who was like, yeah, well, we're not going to do the piggyback stuff. That's not going to be an option. Like this, this works. I feel like because you have so many guys who need to be stretched out, who aren't full-time starters, like in the case of Jorge Lopez and Chris Ellis, but these guys can pitch at the major league level. So why not use Tyler Wells for three, four innings and then bring him in with a Zach Lowther behind him. I just want to see these younger guys get, you know, on a regular routine here. Um, and, you know, Lowther is not going to be able to go, give you five, six innings every start across a full year. I, I don't think. Um, I don't know if you know, Dean Kramer probably could. He's probably the most built up of all those guys. But there's so many young arms who I feel like are it's major league or bust at this point. And so if you can find a way like piggybacking option to help, the most out of them, like why not just do that? But I, I highly doubt the Orioles are actually going to end up doing that. But So I'll throw this out there. Do the two of you feel like Bruce Zimmerman is a lock for the rotation at this point? At this point, I kind of do, even though, I mean, he's only pitched in like one game, right? I think he's pitching again tomorrow. Um, I, I kind of do, yeah. But I don't think he's a lock to stay in the rotation all year. That's for sure. Yeah, I think he definitely is. And I don't know. It was just the stomach bug, flu, whatever it was that was going around. So it's not another injury. Um, I'm curious to see how much work he can get in over the next 10 days as we're two weeks away from opening day. But again, that's another situation where he's not going to be able to give you six innings right out of the gate. But I mean, who else do you have? Like, <laughs> are you going to go with Chris Keegan Aiken, Chris Ellis, Jorge Lopez, John Means, and Jordan Lyles as your opening day or your starting five to start the season? Like, you got better options. I just, I hope the Orioles put those options in there. Yeah, exactly. Put the options in there and be creative with how you uh, manage them for the first part of the season if you have to. So we'll transition now to focusing on individual players and whose performances have stood out to us this spring. And I'm actually going to start with my pick since it kind of just covers what we were talking about, which is the rotation. That's D.L. Hall. Who had an outing on Monday against the Phillies. It was very impressive. One inning, no runners reached base, struck out two, got a fly out to end the inning. Uh, the stuff was apparently hitting high 90s, um, maybe even touched 100 at the state on the stadium gun at one point in Clearwater. Uh, we don't know how accurate that is, but still, he's out there throwing high velocity. It looked like the DL Hall of last year. That first pitch he threw at Mickey Moniak was a little scary. <laughs> But everything from there out looked like the DL Hall of last year. High velocity, good movement, and hitters really just were not squaring up on it at all. He's been opting to the minor leagues, as we mentioned earlier. But it does feel like as long as he is healthy, he's going to put himself in a position where 
we see him in the major leagues at some point this year. It's just a question of in what role. And I'm going to go back to a quote that Mike Elias had recently talking about this, where he uh, – actually, I'm pulling up the wrong quote here, but the thing is that Mike Elias had recently said, and I'm paraphrasing, that we will probably see Hall in the majors and fairly soon, I think was something to that effect. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'll try to find the – full quote before we finish out the segment, but you don't hear Michael Elias say that kind of stuff very often. So to me, it has some credibility. Yeah. God, he looks so freaking good today. Like it was just exciting to see him on the mound pitching in a competitive game after his injury period. But I mean, he's, he's going to be so good. I, it's just a matter of when, not if, um, he, he did, I think it was a stat cast game, right? I think there was stat cast data. He did hit 100 even at least one time on the strikeouts. He averaged 99.1 miles per hour and he, his slider, he only threw two pitches and both looked incredible. If you look on my Twitter, I retweeted Alex fast who put together a, um, one of those things where the same pitch at the same time that the ball comes out of his hand at the exact same place. It looks the same until halfway through and the slider ends up like in the right-handed batter's box. Uh, incredible. 88, 89 miles per hour. And he still has a curveball and a changeup outside of that. So God, just please stay healthy. We'll see you in Baltimore in June and 2023 is going to be fun. Yeah. I, he just had to establish dominance with uh Moniac there in the batter's box first. Um, no, I think that was first batter, lefty, lefty. You know the jitters were there. As confident and D.L. Hall, there's he he tiptoes that confident, <laughs> cocky borderline. Let's let's be honest, and I absolutely love it. Um, but yeah, it was yeah exactly 100 miles an hour, average 90, 91. Like you said, uh, that's impressive. And the slider, yeah, that overlay that Alex Fast put together, you got a 12, 11, 12, 13 mile an hour difference between the fastball and the slider. The same arm angle, the same arm movement, and that ball is the perfect tunneling. And I know that's like one outing there. It was a very small sample there, but that's how lethal DL Hall can be. And like how how can anyone say that they could even luck into getting a foul ball against a major league pitcher? I don't understand after watching something like that. Uh, but yeah, no one's touching those pitches Hall was throwing. Three whiffs uh, seven, on seven swings. That's impressive. Uh, I love it. And he's in, I think they just said he's going to stay in Sarasota to continue to build up innings until he's ready to pitch in game action. I, I do think he's still in that Michael Bauman track. He probably gets a couple low A rehab starts, two, three innings, maybe a handful of starts in Bowie, probably not as long as Michael Bauman did. And then they kind of like fast track him. Cause like you said, Zach, Michael Ice isn't going to say, oh, he could be in the major leagues pretty quickly. Like, Michael Elias doesn't talk like that. He could have easily said, we got to get Hall's innings built back up. We'll see where he's at, you know, in a couple of months. But he's came out and straight said, no, he can reach the majors pretty quickly. So I'm I'm buying it. Let's get excited about D.L. Hall here. I yeah, think it's a matter. Here. Oh, go ahead, Bob. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, I think it's just a matter of don't waste any of these bullets. <laughs> this guy is so good. He's got such a great arm. Just don't keep him trying to build his innings up in the minor leagues because you never know when it's going to go. Get him up to the major leagues as quick as you can and let let him work his magic for as long as he can at the major league level. Hopefully it's for 15 years, but you know you don't want to waste any, any of these 100-mile-an-hour uh, bullets. So here's a quote from Michael Elias, and this um, couple of outlets picked this up. I'm quoting from a piece at uh, Masson on March 15th. During the lockout, he's been throwing and throwing hard. He's kind of ready, but we want to be smart and careful with him. He's on the roster, and I think if he's throwing strikes, he's pretty close to big league ready. We may see this guy in the big leagues this year, and we might see him quick if it's the right thing to do. So the if it's the right thing to do, it's thrown in there at the end. But still, that's a pretty um, upfront quote from Michael Elias, I think. Mm-hmm. Not, not one you see very often from him. And the latest quote from Rock Kabatko here uh, saying, Elias on Kyle Bradish and Dio Hall. For those pitchers in particular, both of whom we saw today, both of whom pitched great, and we saw the talent on display, our main concern is building them up for what we expect will be a long season, much of which will be at the major league level. Like, it's coming. It's These guys are coming. They're here. It's They've still got a lot to prove. I get that. I understand that argument. We have yet to see... We can talk about, and we have talked about this, the point of our show, all of the development down the minor leagues, all the great things, these coaching staff, these instructors, they're doing 
this Bob's talk with John Rose, we're going to talk about in a second. All of that has been, you know, confirmed and reiterated by so many players and coaches in the system, but we haven't seen it translated at the major leagues yet. So I get that why people are still going to be skeptical, but like, we're finally going to be able to, in a couple of, of weeks, couple of months, see this start to roll out and God hope it all plays out because, but uh, we're sitting pretty. I think we're sitting pretty right now. Yeah, that's not an apprehensive quote whatsoever. Not a conservative quote by Michael Elias there at all, much of which will be at the major league level. That to me just it's shows the confidence that he has in these guys. Like these are the top guys. These are the guys that, you know, they're banking on to an extent. Obviously, you never want to bank on one or two players that much, but these are the guys that are going to turn help turn this ship around. So let's get them up here and let's get them acclimated to the major leagues and let's uh Let's get the Orioles way back or I don't know, whatever stupid slogan they want to go up with. We'll turn our attention to the outfield now. Uh, Yusniel Diaz has been ops into the minor leagues despite a pretty hot spring training. Bob, I know, wants to discuss Diaz's spring a little bit. And I think maybe what we see from him now that he's going to open the year in Norfolk and perhaps if and when he fits on the major league roster this year. <laughs> Just when I was about to auction off that jersey or give it away for free, uh, I'm reconsidering now all of a sudden. No. It, it was cool to see Diaz come into camp healthy and perform the way that we know he can when he's healthy and when his mind is, and body is right. Uh, he hits the ball hard. He covers the plate. I don't. He only struck out like once maybe, one, one or two times the whole spring. So it sucked to see him get optioned today. But if he can go to AAA, stay healthy, perform for a month – or two, I think you do see him finally make his major league debut with the Orioles this year. But unfortunately, that's a big if when it comes to using Diaz. But he's off to as good as a start as you could ask for. And we'll just have to see where it goes from here. But I'm happy for him that he at least found some success in March. That's that's the big thing. It's just I don't think anyone is well, anyone who's like reasonably thinking about this is like Diaz needs to be in the starting lineup on opening day. He's healthy. Let's go. He's back. We won. We're winning the Machado trade. Um, it's it's just good to see him healthy right now. And I thought the other day, I said before we hopped on that DJ Stewart. I thought the hand was broken when it got hit. I thought that thing was shattered. Uh, and of course, it's not because it's DJ Stewart, and he just he never leaves, and it's always something. Um, I don't wish injuries on anybody. I'm not you know upset that he's not hurt more, but uh, it's he always does something to stick around. Um, so I thought this was actually happening, but it seems like DJ Stewart's going to be fine. Could be back in a couple of weeks, but with Diaz, like it's never been about the skills. It's never been about a lack of tools. It's just been the health and. We've had John Mioli on the show twice, and he's talked about Diaz and saying when he was in Bowie, like the teammates really looked up to him, and he was the spark plug for that team. And I, I think I've said before on the show that I think a, a healthy Yusniel Diaz across a full season, which that's that's a huge ask, but he's a guy who can hit, you know, two sixty with fifteen plus or minus home runs and twenty five plus or minus doubles across the full season and get on base at a good clip. Um, it's just been about the health. So with him getting an option today, like, yeah, it's, it sucks a little bit because he's been so hot at the major league camp, but he's going to get regular at bats and he's going to be an everyday middle of that lineup, that Norfolk lineup. Can you stay healthy across a couple of months? And then we'll see how the major league lineup shakes out because there's no room in that outfield at the major league level. And that is a good point. He was not going to get regular at bats if he had made the opening day roster. He was going to be there as a fourth or fifth outfielder you know, spelling probably Anthony Santander and Austin Hayes in the corners one or two days a week. Uh, he would not have been in the everyday lineup. And he, he had a limited time at Norfolk last year, struggled um, when he was healthy, although we don't really know how fully healthy he was throughout 2021. So to see him, even if it is just a month, six weeks, to get regular at bats in Norfolk to see if he can stay healthy and see what he can do. I think that's good for him, and it, you know, it could be telling about how he fits into this team this year. Yeah, there's not even a room for him as like a fourth outfielder. Like that's not the kind of guy you want as your fourth outfielder. That's Ryan McKenna. You're going to have Jorge Mateo making this roster as well, who can play the outfield spots. Those are the guys you're going to want to use. So yeah, like where is he going to get at bats this year? Nowhere. We'll we'll see if there's a trade. We'll see if guys finally, you know, the Orioles finally cut bait with some of these outfielders. 
Uh, but for right now, just please, God, stay healthy in Norfolk. <laughs> Let's see something out of Diaz. Yeah, my only thought was maybe he'll make the major league team because is he a guy that you really care if he gets every day at bats anymore? Like, is he a guy that you just want to maybe give him a confidence boost, give him that one or two days a week, and hopefully he can earn more playing time or someone gets hurt and he's already there. But yeah, at the same time, it, it doesn't hurt to send him back down. And then if an injury arises, he's at least there. Uh, I don't know. Is, is it ever going to happen for him? Maybe, maybe not. Will it be in an Orioles uniform? I have my doubts, but come on. I'm rooting for you, Diaz. What what else do we got? We got to say a root for Chris Owens, like to make this <laughs> roster. Like, let's. It's it's good to be hyped about using El Diaz, just because. I mean, the guy was was so good in 2019 for spurts of 2019, and, and you really thought there was something here. Uh, and to see what the last two years he's done, it's yeah, it's. I, I hope he's here. But here's here's another quote too from Elias just now that uh, I think today was a gr- a great demonstration of the future that we have coming and knocking on the door in terms of 2022 debuts. We're going to have a lot of impact talent coming up later this season if these guys stay healthy and do their thing. And could use no Diaz be part of that group? I feel like he was talking more about <laughs> some other guys. But, uh, yeah, no, that's, again, it's an exciting comment. That's an exciting uh, quote there from Michael Ice. Absolutely. We'll um, talk about someone who's not a prospect – but is still intriguing to us. Somebody I think we've all three kind of been high on in the past and we think is poised for a big breakout this year, and that's Dylan Tate. And I'll let Nick uh, start us off with that discussion. Yeah, I put Tate up here because it's only been three innings, but I'm happy to see Tate have a really good spring as well. Um, I think a lot of other guys have kind of been performing as expected. Um and I know I'm sure a lot of people expected Tate to be, you know, pitch really well, but he looked really, really good out there. Um, going back to 2018, like he was a starter when he was with the Yankees. And then he came over to Bowie where he was a starter and he just, he wasn't that good. Now you move him to the bullpen back in 2020. And ever since then, it's, you've seen flashes of what he could become. And then he had that really great debut. I think it was in 2020 uh, in the major leagues. Last year was rough, Rocky, but I think that was just not having a rotation and, and poor management of pitchers. And now he comes out, we, we're well aware of everything he's done at driveline. Um, I think you keep Tate in that short relief role, and he's showing some of the numbers. And it was actually uh, Sung Min Kim, shout out to him. Uh, he was he was quicker than me the other night when the uh, Orioles played the Yankees. They had uh, StatCast data there for that, that game. Uh, shout out to these teams that give us the StatCast data, the StatCast broadcast. But uh, – Tate threw 12 pitches against New York, got five called or, or swinging strikes, good average there. Sinker, 94 miles an hour, a little bit slower than, than last year, but had an additional four inches of drop on it. Uh, it was like average, like 29 inches of, of vertical movement in the league average in Major League Baseball this year was 21 inches. Uh, and then he comes in with the slider. There's a five mile an hour difference. The, the slider was five miles an hour slower than last year, creating this massive velo difference between his sinker and and the slider, which he also added seven inches of vertical break on the slider. I mean, so this is – there's real movement with these pitches. Um, and I, I think he's having a fantastic spring, and I think if you put him in the right role, Dylan Tate could really take off this year. Yeah, and Connor Newcomb had a great interview with the driveline guy from uh, Unlocked on Orioles this past week. So I think this is a great shout-out. Uh, I think Tate's going to be good this year. I think he might be like a Jim Johnson type – you know, his sinker. And I do think that that's key. They get that speed or velocity differentiation uh, from his slider and his sinker. I think that'll help a lot. And uh, yeah, I think the Orioles bullpen is going to be a lot better than people think this year. You got guys like Brian Baker, Felix Bautista coming on potentially. Um, the the lefty that pitched today that I'm blank on his name that they claimed off of waivers is uh, looking really good as well. So uh, as long as the starters can give them any more breathing room than they did last year, I think bullpen might be okay. And Paul Final Fry's Perez is who I was thinking of. <laughs> and Paul Paul Fry's mm-hmm. been okay. He was pretty decent the other day too. So maybe it's, you know, just hide him against Tampa Bay and maybe he's, he's back and is effective for you. So yeah, I do think the, the bullpen is going to be a, a good strength of this team. Yeah, I see Dylan Tate as a big breakout candidate coming into this year. I think that he's always had good stuff that could play up in a bullpen. 
he's obviously put a lot of work in over the off season to get better. And in limited samples this spring, we have seen that come through. I think that the challenge for him and for every other reliever this year is going to be making sure they're not overworked because that's kind of what happened with the Orioles last year. So you hope that a healthy John means uh, Jordan Lyles can be a big, can be a step in that direction but that everyone beyond them steps up a little bit more than they did last year in the back part of the rotation so that you're not overworking your bullpen. Yeah, and John Means came out and said he wants to throw 200 innings this year. Jordan Lowell's had a nice, solid three innings in his spring debut. I mean, it's all coming up roses. Uh, Hopefully uh, Lowell's new slider is just as good as it was to end the, the year, and maybe he can give you 150 innings, and maybe Means can give you like 170, 180 innings, and and that'll definitely help keep the bullpen fresh. And it's obviously going to come down to spots three for five, which we've already talked about are pretty much question mark, question mark, question mark, at least to start the year. So we'll see how it goes. And more breaking news here. There's a lot going on tonight uh, as we're recording. <laughs> um, if you're looking for more free agents, I don't know. I know there've been a lot of guys, especially in the Patreon group, that guys have been hyping up as, as viable options that the Orioles could use and make this rotation better. Uh, Chris Archer is off the board and he's going to the Minnesota Twins, who are just picking off all the Orioles. Uh, can't <laughs> Brett Anderson, so come on down. So before we move on um, to our discussion about John Rhodes, I, I do want to take a little bit of time to acknowledge how good Kyle Braddis looked today. And I know we talked about that a little bit, but he struck out Bryce Harper and JT Real Muto. And Nick, I think you hit the nail on the head on Twitter. Even Bryce Harper like standing there watching Kyle Braddis today. <laughs> that Okay, that broadcast, they love the fact that Bryce Harper was kept chirping in the batter dogs, went to the dugout and kept chirping again, caused the umpire to yell back uh, in a spring training game. They even talked to Joe Girardi at the end of the game. I love that Bryce Harper uh, chirping over there. Like, no, you're a tool. That's that's what you are. You're, Bryce Harper is a tool. Uh, and Kyle Braddis struck you out, and it was amazing to watch. Uh, yeah, Braddish. I love seeing the hype around Bradish. I am love the hype around D.L. Hall as well. Like To see so many other people getting so excited about these young guys again, it's it's so much fun. Um, he, he got into some trouble. He did have a couple walks there, a couple hits. There. We'll admit that. That's kind of what he does. But he got out of it against a major league lineup. So that was, that was good to see. Good promising outing today. And like we said, he had to get an extra out in that first inning that he pitched because of the error by Jorge Mateo, which was nice he could do that. But the pure stuff is just is so good from Bradish. I mean, he's hitting 97.4, 97.5 with the fastball, not averaging that, more closer to 95, but the curveball, the slider, it all looks so good. And I just feel like he's going to he's gonna be uh, firmly established in the rotation second half of this year. And he's done all this. It's not like he's – facing against uh, single-A, double-A hitters later in these spring training games. I mean, he's facing big league, good offensive lineups. They're starting players, so and, and he's performing really well. So very happy for him. Can't wait to see him at the major league level. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll uh, talk now about a piece that Bob has over at BaltimoreSportsAndLife.com, which is part two of a two-part series where he talks about – talks to Orioles prospects – about the work they put in over the offseason to get better in 2022. And there's also a little bit of discussion about organizational philosophy in these articles. Part one was with Zach Peake, who we've had on this show before. And part two is with John Rhodes, the 2021 draft pick out of the University of Kentucky, who all three of us are starting to move up our prospect board a little bit, a big believer in his potential. He's gotten in a few spring training games this year or so. Hopefully fans have had a chance to see him in those games if they didn't get to see him in Delmarva or the FCL last year. So, Bob, um, first of all, great series. But uh, what you. were your thoughts talking to uh, John Rhodes? I was very impressed by John Rhodes. I, it was a great conversation. We talked for like 20 minutes. Just very bright, engaging, smart kid. Very mature for his age, like really seems like he's bought into what the Orioles are doing. And yeah, the second piece was a little bit longer just because he had so many money quotes that I, I wanted to get in there that are just beacons of a bright spot on the player development that's going on right now. And yeah, I'm, I was really impressed with the kid and he comes in a couple of spring training games and, and shows out like hits a home run, 
has a assist in the outfield, another line drive single. So he's making his presence known. We'll see what he can do with this first full season. Yeah, I really, really enjoyed reading this uh, because you could tell just, you know, it, it was just you who talked to him. We weren't on that call, but I could tell how excited he was. You know, I could get that from his quotes that he genuinely is enjoying this or being in this organization. And he's excited about the guys that he's surrounded by. Um, I think one of the other things that stood out to me too, was that based on his comments about his own play, you know, he's like, I wasn't barreling the baseball. Like that was just non-existent by the end of the year. And that's something that I really trying to work on and using the KVS technology to tell, to get his swing lined up because, you know, the Orioles are teaching something different than what he was taught in college. And that all that lines up perfectly with kind of what I saw, not the the swing pattern and stuff. I didn't see that last year, but in terms of like all the pieces are there with John Rhodes and why I said right after the season ended, I think this could be the real sleeper of this draft class um, because all the pieces are there. Can he put them all together? And it sounds like he's, he's on his way to doing that. And I also just love that, you know, he's like, yeah, Adley's a man. Stowers is a man. Gunner's a man. Like he's excited about all of these guys. He's giving, huge kudos to the front office and what they're building. Um, and everybody's bought in. Like this is something we hear from so many players and coaches that this is a very tight knit fraternity of guys. Uh, and they're, they're on this journey together, which is, is really awesome to see. I think he even said in there, like I talked to guys when I was in college who were in the big leagues or in the pros and were like, yeah, it's kind of, you do your own thing. That's not the case here uh, with the Orioles. You talk about the Oriole way. They're creating a new Oriole way. And it looks like it's a, a fun, positive environment. Yeah, I found the part about the K-Vest to be really interesting because that kind of lifts up the hood a little bit about what goes into the player development process, but it also shows how much he buys into it, which was really encouraging to see. Yeah, for sure. I mean, when this interview was over, I was like skipping around, excited for Orioles baseball and the future of the team. So it was cool, and I I liked the K-Vest stuff was great just just to get a more specific angle of what they're doing exactly and it's funny he was just so praising of Adley Rutschman like he's incredible his swing is beautiful even stuff I didn't put in the article quotes of his with uh about Adley and Gunnar Henderson he thinks he's going to be a superstar um yeah it was it was just great it was a, a lot of fun to talk to him and I like the quote where he's like the the longer you're around it the more you believe it so it just seems like the buy-in is just growing and growing as time goes on yeah, I, I love that they're using – you're getting deeper. There's a lot of outfield competition in the system, and I really get the sense that you know someone like John Rhodes or uh, Billy Cook and all these guys aren't going home saying, like, ah, this is this is tough. Like, I don't know if I can break this lineup. I, what do I have to do? Like, it's not they're going to come out the next day and then press harder to try to win that spot. It seems like they're all working together to make each other better. And uh, if someone has a big game or – you know, they end up getting a few extra at bats. I, I feel like these guys are congratulating the, their teammates and they're happy. For, they're genuinely happy for them. And this is where it, it all starts. You know, if you like to use the word culture or not, like this is you're building from the ground up. And, you know, these guys are now joining the the coaches that are training these kids. They're starting to work their way up to the major leagues with Ryan Fuller in the big leagues right now. It, and it's all going to start meshing together over the next year or two. And it's, it's really hard not to be excited. And you know what, if, they don't crack the major leagues with the Orioles. You know what? They're still developing talented players who they can trade away uh, for really talented major leaguers. So it's it's a win-win situation there. Another big takeaway I had from the interview was just, it seems like the Orioles are preaching, do not, like, it's okay to fail. Like, do not stress about being perfect every time. You make a mistake, that's part of the game. You learn from it instead of getting down on yourself because of it. So I do think that that could go along with, the reason that, you know, the place they've been able to improve the things that they're trying to improve and the stuff they're implementing is working. And I think the next frontier for the Orioles player development might be preventing injuries and getting people back faster and better from injuries, which I think we've actually seen uh, reflected this spring. I think Eric talked about it where guys look like they haven't missed a beat and they seem like they're stronger than ever coming back from injury. So Hopefully, the, again, I, I noted it in the article. Yeah, it hasn't been proven at the major league level, but as these coaches and these systems work their way up, hopefully we see that continue at the major league level and and we can go from there. Yeah, all good takeaways from these interviews. So be sure to check them out over at BaltimoreSportsAndLife.com and check out the other coverage that's on the site there too. 
uh, including college sports, Ravens, other Orioles coverage, and more. And we'll uh, wrap up tonight's show by talking about a preseason poll that happened in our Patreon group, <coughs> which is open to monthly subscribers. And we've had a few of these now, but this is one that we're going to release to our audience everywhere just to get a sense of what kind of discussions go on here and kind of give our commentary on some key topics for the Orioles that deal in prospects, obviously, but then also look at the major league roster. We had 19 responses to this poll and I'll start off with the first question and I'll backtrack for a moment and shout out Brandon, the Patreon, the patron who has been organizing these polls. He did an excellent job once again. So I'll start off with the first question, which is among the three guys that the Orioles gave major league deals to this offseason, who ends up with the longest tenure as an Oriole? Jordan Wiles won with 10 votes, followed by Robinson Chirinos with seven and Rugnet Odor with two. I would take it based off of our discussion earlier about infielders that neither of you are particularly surprised by this response and that you probably don't disagree with it either. No, uh, I, I would say Lyles. I think as long as he does what he's brought in to do, he'll stay in the rotation all year. And I thought with Chirinos, you know, he's a veteran. It seems like the, the league is a pretty high opinion of him, who he is as a ball player and as a teammate. So I'm wondering, you know, if Chirinos is a guy who, when you get closer to the trade deadline, teams looking for that backup catcher come calling, you know, due to injuries or something, and you move him, like maybe for cash. Or, you know, a 17-year-old Dominican Summer League prospect, nothing of, of real value right now. But um, I, I could see that situation by playing out, which is why I'm going to go Jordan Lyles, the number two man in, in Baltimore's rotation. First of all, I want to shout out that this is one of my favorite new things that we're doing with the the patrons, and Brandon's a big part of that. And it's fun just to get a, a glimpse of what our uh, – you know, most valued listeners uh, think about these topics and then we can comment on them as well. But yeah, it's got to be Lyles. That has to be for sure the favorite. But I, I can make a case for Chirinos to be the answer just because Odor is never going to be the answer for me, at least. Uh, maybe Lyles pitches so good that he becomes a valuable trade piece by the deadline. Or And Chirinos, what? You're not going to get much for him if, if, you know, he's playing well at the deadline. And maybe you just want to keep that veteran presence with Adley all year long. So that's my case for maybe Chirinos being an answer, but I, I would still go with Lyles, Lyles ultimately. Lyles. <laughs> if you can get uh, Graffinino and Greg Cullen for, who was it? I can't remember his name now. Tommy something, whatever his Tommy name Malone. was. Tommy <laughs> Malone. Um, yeah, I imagine you know you can get some, some nice uh, young high flyer uh, prospects for Jordan Lyles, and uh, I wouldn't hate that. Going to the second question now. Among these three, who do you think has the best bounce back season in 2022? The options were UCL Diaz, Ryland Bannon, or Dean Kramer. UCL Diaz picked up 11 votes with Bannon and Kramer splitting with four each. So clearly maybe some people felt this way coming into camp anyways, but um, some, some of the hype that is built for UCL Diaz having a healthy and productive spring carrying over a little bit here are these results. I'd put the highest odds at Kramer, just the health. I don't think Diaz can stay healthy for you. We, we kind of already talked about this, but I'd, we talked about what we liked about Kramer today and this spring. I'd give the highest odds of a good bounce back to, to Kramer with, with Bannon as the, the sleeper pick, but it's, it's, that's a deep, deep sleep pick. I actually like all three to bounce back in some regards. I think they'll all have better 2022s and 2021s, but yeah, Kramer, I think – at the very least, he should be able to be a decent multi-inning reliever. I don't know, but Bannon, I feel like it was important for him to have a decent spring, and he for sure did that. So maybe that gets him some confidence and he can have a more normal year and take over from the gold glove winning Kelvin Gutierrez at some point too. So looking at the next question, and this is a, an interesting one, and it was close, relatively close. Over under 10 major league appearances this year for D.L. Hall. 13 voters took the under, with the remaining six taking the over. I'll admit that I'm really torn on this one, because if you had asked me this a month ago, I would have taken the under, and now I'm not as sure. So this is an interesting question. Completely agree. Uh, These Elias comments have me thinking that over, just because I think he could be here 
maybe mid July, uh, which should be able to give him 10 plus appearances, especially if they're not going to start him. And maybe he's more of a multi inning reliever, at least to start his career. So I, I'm going to go with the over on this one. Yeah, I'm going over as well, just because it was like that comment that Zach brought up earlier when we were talking about Hall. That's what you know led me to to think it's going to be over earlier. And then these more recent quotes and watching that outing today, I think just solidifies that. That yeah, it, I think a good follow up question to that would be, you know, is it more starts or is it more bullpen appearances? And and either way, it, it's going to be over ten appearances in the major leagues this year. I think. Yeah, absolutely. I think if it were ten starts might give it a little bit more pause, but I think I agree that it's going to be the over on 10 appearances. And that goes right into the next question, which is over under 80 innings pits at the major league level this year for Grayson Rodriguez. 10 voters took over and nine took under. So about as close of a vote as you can get. Uh, This is a tough one for me. I'm going to say under. Uh, I think just something else you keep hearing a lot from the organization is that like we're looking at the, for these guys in their future careers and hopefully their long careers at the major league level. And so I just think I, I want to see Rodriguez go deeper into games at Norfolk first. And, and then once he gets to the major leagues, you know, are they going to let him go out every five days and try to go six, seven innings, or are they going to try to, you know, save him a little bit by the end of the year? I'm sure there's going to be some sort of total innings limit for sure. Um, so that's why I probably say at the major league level he's going to go under that. But hopefully we get a, a handful of good, solid, deep outings, and then he's ready to go full time, full go as a major league rotation piece in twenty twenty three. It's a good number. Uh, that was uh, if Vegas. It seemed like Vegas made that number. It was so good. Um, I'm going to be optimistic, probably wrong, but I think he's going to be up fairly soon, maybe mid May. So I'm going with the over. Constantly optimistic, but why not? Yeah, this is a hard one because it is all about the timing of when he gets to the major leagues. Um, Because you have to figure that after throwing, you know, 103 innings last year, he's not going to make that bump up to 175, 180. It's going to be somewhere maybe more in the 150 range. So at that rate, I probably would take the under, but this is a really tough question. Yeah, I don't know what Brandon does. Yeah, I don't know what Brandon does for a living. Um, I feel like he actually told me earlier, but uh, whatever you do, I, I feel like it's it's got to be working for one of these uh, FanDuel or, or DraftKings or something. And if not, maybe you should uh, give them a call because good lines here. And, and we know Manny Machado is a big fan of Brandon as well, based on the shirt he was wearing last week. <laughs> so, Next question. Uh, <laughs> over or under 60 MLB games played this year for Kyle Stowers. Over uh, one with 14 votes, with five uh, patrons taking the under. So much stronger consent, a little bit stronger consensus here than it was on DL Hall, and a much stronger one than it was on Grayson Rodriguez. Was it 60 games? Was the was the number? Yeah, 60 MLB yeah. games. Yeah, I think I got to go over just because I mean, the fact that he's he's still on the roster, he's still batting cleanup in these spring training games and starting most games in right field shows that we knew they were high on him, but it just shows that they think he's fairly close and they want to get him as much uh, v- uh, views of these major league pitchers as possible before eventually going down to AAA. I think we all expect that. But And he hasn't put up the numbers that you would love to see him come out and do, but he's showed some glimpses. He's hit a bomb or two, a nice piece of hitting. He's showed some patience. So I think he's shown what he can do. He hasn't put it all together this spring, but we've already talked about how useless spring stats are. Um, so I'm going to go over. I think he's another one that watching the games, you, you get a different takeaway from Stowers. Uh, other than today's game, it was kind of a rough one for him. But overall, it, he's playing better than what the stats are showing for sure. Uh, but I think Elias also just came out with a quote in this conference he just had where he said Stowers does have a lot to prove still at AAA. So, um, I mean, before that, I, I think I picked uh, I'm going to take the under. I just think there's too many variables here. You've got DJ Stewart, who you know has something on someone in this organization. You've got Santander. Is he healthy? What happens there? You got Diaz. Would they would they give Diaz if there is that opening? Would they give it to Diaz first over Stowers if Diaz is healthy? Probably. Um, so yeah, I think there's there's too many variables for me to go confidently over there. Yeah, that's where I struggle. It's just that there are so many variables that are beyond Stowers' control, which is you know when are any of the outfielders traded? Because 
let's say the Santan there goes at the deadline. That's two months, which probably ends up at about 60 games, maybe a little bit less. The one thing that I do like is that the Orioles really are challenging Sowers this spring. He's starting games. He's batting cleanup. He's going up against, you know, a mix of minor league guys and some veterans. And, you know, the one takeaway I have from his spring, if I had to pick a positive, it'd be the home run that he hit off of Jose Quintanilla last week. You know, Quintanilla basically threw him that curveball down in the zone back-to-back times. Stower swung right through it third time. You know, and this was – it was actually a good pitch. Throws it again, Stowers crosses it. You like seeing those kinds of adjustments being made. Um, so I do think that Kyle Stowers still has some things to prove, Michael, like, like Michael Elias said. But I think the Orioles are taking the right approach with challenging him. Uh, that's a long-winded way, I know, of answering this question. And uh, I'm just going to take the under, uh, even though part of me really hopes that it is the over. Well, one other thing to consider is, and we have this on great authority, that trade Man- Trey Mancini will be traded within the next week or months and there will be pitchforks down at the warehouse but maybe that dh spot gets opened up and you know diaz and stowers have more room to play there as well i didn't think about that uh yeah it is true but yeah that home run swing was like that was it like that's that's what you want to see out of kyle stowers because that's a pitch that someone like stowers is is swinging and missing on you know 99 percent of the time i feel like that that was a good dirty pitch um and Stowers goes down to one knee and picks it up and sends it out of the ballpark. Uh, that's that's what he can do. Uh, and we know the strikeouts are going to be high, but obviously the Orioles aren't concerned because he does do damage and, and he can hit it softly the other way for a nice little base hit. So it'll be interesting to see uh, when he comes up. So what level does Connor Norby reach this year? That is the next question on the survey. Double A Bowie won with 13 votes with Triple A Norfolk following with six. High A and MLB were also options, but they did not record votes. So double A wins. And I agree with this result. I think that Norby is an advanced hitter who is going to do just fine at Aberdeen. I think he'll do well at Bowie, too, when he gets there, as long as he makes the adjustments he needs to make. So I I agree with this result. Yeah. um, I think as long as they maintain the promotion style from you know affiliate to affiliate that they had last year i think he'll start in high a and then around mid-season make the jump up to double a and you know just because the triple a season is a couple weeks longer than double a maybe he gets a week at triple a but i doubt it so yeah i agree double a is probably the answer i say if the hit tool is as advertised uh and it, he hits well against more advanced pitching that's the big thing like how are these guys these draft picks gonna fare against high a pitching uh it's we know the pitching in low a apparently you've heard from a lot of people you know it wasn't great uh so if the hit tool is as advertised though i could see him getting a cup of coffee a small cup of coffee uh at triple a to end the year why not so we'll go to this question here and i think this might be the most interesting question on the survey among these four who has the highest ceiling? And it's looking at four outfield prospects, including the last two first rounders in the Orioles farm system. Colton Cowser won this poll with 10 votes, followed by Heston Kerstab with seven votes. Kyle Stowers picks up two and zero for Hudson Haskin, who was also an option. Um, this is a good question. Um, and I think there's an argument for these, you know, any of these players to win it. But I'm curious to hear what you think. And I'll start with Bob. I do think Kowser's the answer. I think he has the highest floor and the highest ceiling of these guys. I just think his attitude, his his work ethic, his style of play with the, the plate discipline, the contact skills, the potential power to add to his frame and the way that he could stick in center field. I mean, he's almost like a, a five, a lower grade, like a five tool player there. So I think that's the answer, but I don't know. Between Kerstad and Stowers, I think – it's unfortunate with this hamstring injury. It really is because it would have been nice to see him get a full season or at least close to it in this year. But I think I would go Stowers over Kerstad at this point. Yeah, I think Hudson Haskin is slightly slept on. He's not my answer, but just wanted to throw that out there since we're bringing up his name. Uh, but I'm going to go with Kowser as well. Just He doesn't have the power that Kerstad or Stowers does, obviously, but – like you said, he is a center fielder, and it seems like he's going to stick at that position, at least for the time being. 
there's no immediate talk of him moving to a corner spot. Uh, the hit tool is, is much better. And unlike Kirsten and Stowers, you're not going to hear anybody talk about Kowser striking out a lot. He's fantastic plate discipline. He showed that this spring. Um, so I think his command of the strike zone is extremely advanced for such an inexperienced pro hitter. And his at-bats always aren't you know, maybe the most entertaining, but like they're works of art most of the time. And you just have to sit back and appreciate them. And so that's why I think just he has more of the total package, which I, I think leads to the, the higher ceiling there because it's so difficult because you met the curse that injury. Like, how do we evaluate this guy? Where do you rank him on a list? Like, how do we talk about curse at this point? Because there's just, we're going on what almost three years since he's played a regular baseball. It's, it's difficult. Yeah. This, this is a tough question and I will go with Calder, um just because of the positional certainty. And I think everything he brings to the table, but there is a strong argument that you could take, Kerstad or Stowers because of their power and the fact that both are likely to stick in right field as long as they're healthy. And I agree with Nick. Haskin has absolutely slept on. And he was putting together a nice year before he got hurt last year. And I think as long as you know he comes back healthy, we're going to see good things from him this year. So we'll go to the next question now, which is, right in your answer, who's the Orioles opening day starting pitcher Next year, which is 2023, John Means wins with 13 votes, followed by Grayson Rodriguez with six. They were the only two pitchers to receive votes. Uh, give me DL Hall. I love what I saw today enough to say, if, if especially if you know the Elias courts lead to him maybe making it to the major leagues before Grayson Rodriguez somehow, uh, maybe. I don't know, but even, no matter who's starting out of those three, and even Bradish, who knows. Uh, that would that would be exciting to watch. So I'm going to go with Dale Hall just because he was so good today. But next year's rotation is going to be miles better than this year's. It's got to be. Um, but we also said that last year. Um, <laughs> That's fair. I'm going to say someone not in the organization. I you know what you make a trade. You you a lot of these top prospects are going to be that much closer to the big leagues. Uh, you're going to have more questions answered this year. So maybe fingers crossed, hoping, praying, whatever I got to do. This is the off season where I don't know if they're necessarily going to spend a big on a big free agent pitcher, but maybe we see a, a huge trade and that's, that's the guy uh, that takes over next year. I don't know. Shane Bieber. Uh, I'll take it. He, he's won me fantasy leagues before. So I don't want to. I'm of those two options, I think I would go the safer route and go with Means, but it is wide open because it could be Rodriguez, it could be Hall. I don't think John Means is necessarily going to be traded like a lot of people seem to think. Um, but I also don't rule out what Nick said, which is that it's someone from outside the organization. So I'll go with the, que- the question that is the most similar to this because I did jump the order on the questions, and we'll get back on track here in a minute, but... Right in your answer, who's the Orioles next? Who's the Orioles starting shortstop on opening day 2023? Jordan Westberg picked up seven votes, although one person specified Westberg at short with Gunnar Henderson at third base. Um, Joey Ortiz picked up three votes, followed by Carlos Correa and Ramon Rodriguez and Gunnar Henderson with two votes each. Jorge Mateo also picking up a pair of votes. And then Caden Grenier with one vote. So an interesting mix of results here. <laughs> Show um, yourself. <laughs> it was Chris. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll say Westberg. I don't know. I think he's close to the majors. I think we could see him in the major leagues by the end of the year. I'll, I'll throw my name in there as Westberg. I... Would love to say Korea, but I'm going to say Joey Ortiz starting shortstop, Westberg starting third baseman. Yeah, I'm going to go Joey Ortiz too. Um, I don't know where Westberg's going to fit in, but I think that Joey Ortiz will be the starting shortstop on opening day 2023. That would be awesome. I think uh, Joey Ortiz has displayed uh, some really good skills at spring training this year. And if he's healthy, I think he, he'll be right there, at least in consideration for sure. Next spring training, we'll have to predict uh, who's going to win the shortstop battle? So speaking of Joey Ortiz, he was the winner of this question, which is who reaches the big leagues first? And there's four options here. 
Joey Ortiz, Jordan Westberg, Drew Rahm, and Kyle Bronovitz. And the vote went in that order. Joey Ortiz picks up nine, followed by Jordan Westberg at six, Drew Rahm at three, Kyle Bronovitz at one. Now, I'm going to go ahead and give my order of how I see this shaking out right now in terms of order. Ortiz, Bronovitz, Westberg, Rahm. Hmm. But I'm curious to get your thoughts on that. I actually think it'll be Westberg, Bronovich, Ortiz, Rom. Hmm. I just love all of this Joey Ortiz <laughs> hype. That uh, now it seems like I I feel like I'm the lowest guy on Joey Ortiz now, uh, but I love it. Um, I'm going to say Jordan Westberg. Like I just mentioned, I think he could be up in the major leagues by the end of this year. I still think there are a couple questions about Joey Ortiz, Drew Rom is going to be the breakout star hopefully uh, of this year uh he's just he's so young he just turned 21 um i think he starts back in double a bronovich could be an interesting choice i'm curious to see where he starts like do they start him in triple a or is he going to be forced out and start in double a because that norfolk rotation is going to be so deep i don't know but bronovich is like He's he's a seasoned prospect. Like he's he's pretty much maybe a little bit of time in AAA. He probably won't need much time because he's he's fully baked. I mean, he's I feel like he's ready to go pretty soon. So I could see him in the major leagues probably by the end of the year out of the bullpen. Who eventually plays the most career games as an Oriole? And we've got three infielders hmm. uh, here. Connor Norby won with nine votes, followed by Joey Ortiz at eight and Taryn Vavra with two. This one's really tough because I oh I hate saying this uh, as a self proclaimed like president of the Connor Norby fan club I'm I'm not gonna say Connor Norby uh, I'm gonna say Taron Vavra just because I think he is a super utility option that sticks around the majors for a very long time I, I liked what I saw a little bit of him this spring um, yeah he's good judgment at the plate good contact skills he just has to stay healthy that's that's injuries are concerned with him going back to his college days uh, but. I'll save ever. If they all hit their 80th percentile expectation, I'd say Norby for sure. But uh, I'm going to go with Joey Ortiz just because much like you said with Vavra, his utilityness, um, Ortiz, his defense, and he can play that stellar defense at three different positions, second, short, third. So I just feel like he's the safest bet to stick around a while and stay relatively cheap enough where they're keeping him on the roster, even if he's not a starter. So that's why I'll go with Joey Ortiz. We'll stick this up and I'll give different answers. I'll go with Connor Norby. I just think that his profile as an everyday second baseman is something that can be realized, uh, especially if he taps into his power. And uh, we got a comment here from Sim Contribute that the obstacle with um, Norby is that he's limited to one position, which I agree with. But if he develops the power, Everything is right there for him to be a successful everyday second baseman. So I'll go with Norby. Like, it. did we see Ortiz talking about positional flexibility? Did we see him in any other position this spring? Do you guys remember? Because I, it was cool to see Vavro work out there in center field, um, but I don't know if Ortiz got any work. I can't remember. He played second base today for an inning before moving. Okay. I think it, it'll be interesting. Sure. To, yeah. I just think it'll be interesting to see where they move him around when the regular season starts. I imagine he starts in Bowie. wonder if he's the full-time shortstop or do we see him in the outfield a little bit and moved around a little bit, but we'll see. What level does Kobe Mayo reach this year? Double A wins with 13 votes, followed by triple A at six votes. MLB and high A were also options, but they did not receive votes. If he makes triple A, Get ready. He's like one of the top five <laughs> prospects in baseball, and that's not a joke. Um, uh, I think double A. I think much like I said with Norby, I just feel like that was kind of the pattern last year. If you get a half a season per level, if you're performing up to, you know, where where they want to give you a little more uh, adversity to face. So I think if he's performing at high A in the first half, he'll, he'll make it up to double A. Um, so that would be awesome to have a 20, 21-year-old at double A killing the ball so i'll take that but i don't think it's out of the question that he spends a whole year in high a so that should have got at least one vote probably yeah because he's he's so so young uh and he had so few at bats uh last year with the late start because of the injury um 
I mean, this is a future first baseman of this organization. Ryan Mountcastle, like the clock's ticking, buddy, because Kobe Mayo, that play today. Uh, no, I just want to see if uh, Eric's listening over there. Um, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm going to be bullish and say a little bit of time in double A, like because of the reason you just mentioned, you know, the Orioles like to challenge these guys. So if as long as he's feeling comfortable in high A, you know, the strikeouts stay low and he continues to, to hit the ball hard and he, he shows well against high A pitching, I think they spend that final month or so of the year and say, all right, let's see what you can do in double A. Um, you know, let's challenge you for these last couple of weeks before you head off into the offseason. Yeah, that's really going to be key is making sure the strikeouts stay down because we talked about this earlier, that low A pitching we had heard from multiple people was not as good last year. So he is probably going to be challenged by the better secondaries at high A. I will say this about Mayo. There's been a few times where I brought it up on this show that, you know, maybe the power won't quite translate at Aberdeen. We'll have to see it's a bit of a pitcher's park. I'm not really worried about that with Kobe Mayo. The left field batting cage roof at Ripken Stadium better be ready for some wear and tear this year. His comment about them moving the left field wall back still is like hilarious to me. And I love that confidence. So, yeah, I can't agree more. Which of these middle infield combos would you most want to eventually see in Baltimore? So we're going off of want, not necessarily what you think you're going to see. Jordan Westberg, Gunnar Henderson uh, with eight votes, followed by Taryn Vavra, Gunnar Henderson at three votes. Taryn Vavra, Joey Ortiz, Jordan Westberg, Joey Ortiz, Connor Norby, Gunnar Henderson, and Connor Norby, Joey Ortiz, all picking up two votes. So some splitting of the vote down the ballot, allows the Westbrook Henderson combo to win this poll by a pretty wide margin. Yeah, that's that's the combo I'm dreaming on. Uh Westberg and Henderson. Although, you know, like Bob said earlier, he snuck in a Westbrook at third base. Uh I, I do think like if you expand this to the ideal infield, and we know the odds of this happening are extremely low, but I daydream about Ryan Mountcastle, Joey Ortiz at second, Gunnar Henderson at short, Jordan Westbrook at third base, Adley Rutschman behind the dish. Like that's that's World Series 2024, uh, all lined up, all written all over it. Um, but Kirby yeah, Mayo was, in left field, left field. Um, <laughs> I, I, I would say Westberg, uh, I would say Westberg Henderson. Why not? The want is different than what I think. So, what I want is Ortiz at shortstop, he hits his his uh, ceiling there and, and hits well enough and fields obviously, he already fields well enough to make that an exciting player to have at shortstop and Norby hits his potential as well. So maybe not the name value that people are looking for, but Ortiz Norby, it would be exciting to me. Yeah, this is a tough one. I mean, based off of what I want, because I would honestly be happy with any of them. I think I dream more about Westberg and Henderson on the same side of the infield for a little while. So both playing the left side of the infield, maybe until Mayo gets there, but of this list, yeah, it is probably the most exciting to think about, so I'll go with the majority here. But it, and there's strong arguments for any of these. So the last question that we'll read off here. Write in your answer. Who's the first player from the Major League active roster to get traded? The winner of the poll, Anthony Santander, with eight votes, followed by Trey Mancini at six, Cole Saucer and Tanner Scott at two apiece, and Tyler Nevin with one. It's surprising to see Nevin in there, but all of the others seem like viable trade candidates. Scott was seemed like somebody who could go at the deadline last year. Mancini and Santander, there's been a ton of speculation about their trade prospects. And Cole Saucer, after a productive 2021, could be a bullpen arm that contenders are seeking down the stretch if he repeats that in 2022. So some interesting options here. Yeah. Salser's Salser's definitely kind of a, a guy that gets overlooked in this bullpen. Uh, he's definitely a good piece that could possibly be moved at the deadline, like you said. But I think the first, I don't know if Santander, like he's really got to turn it on to create any value. I think the Orioles missed their shot with Tanner Scott. Um, I think a lot of people also need to remember like Tanner Scott's getting, he's getting up there in age. Uh, so I don't know how much longer we're going to hold out hope there for, for Scott. I like, he like 28 or something now, like, He's getting closer to, to 30 there. Uh, so I think the obvious answer is 
is Trey Mancini. It's it's happening next week to a what was it an NL West team or an NL team? Is that where where he's going over there? For sure. <laughs> I think the answer is going to be Paul Fry. I think he's going to bounce back, start out the year hot. And we've seen in the past, like with Richard Blyer, that if Elias has a trade lined up that is getting him a player that he likes, he's not going to delay and wait till close to the deadline to do it. So I could see a Paul Fry trade around May um, just to get that left-handed arm onto a more contending club's bullpen and we get an international prospect or two that we're talking about in a year or two. Yeah, I would say Santander. It's uh, yeah. I just think that there is the most there's incentive to trade him for two reasons. Number one is that he's a player who has had stretches of time where he's been brilliant, but he's also often injured, um, doesn't get on base at a high rate. So if he's hot out of the gate and he looks like he did in 2020, you're going to be inclined to move him early. And the other thing too is that. Trading Anthony Santander does not conflict with the goal of trying to make this team better next year or even this year because you have the depth in the minor leagues to sustain that. And I know you could say the same of Mancini, but when you look at the outfielders that are going to be in Norfolk, if just one of them can make the major league roster and stick by the time Santander is traded, that's another reason to look at moving him because – that gives you your opportunity to decide, okay, you know, Kyle Stowers is hitting well down in Norfolk this year. We think he's our everyday right fielder in 2023, but we also know that he has things he needs to work on. So let's bring him up August 1st and have him hit against major league pitching for the last two months of the year. Yeah. I think that's, that is a good point about, you know, you can move Santander and you're not going to lose a ton of value with who you replace them with just because like, I do agree. I think Santander there can be an exciting player. I think it could be a really good fourth outfielder for some team. He can fill in uh, spot starts there in center field, even uh, and you don't want him out there, but he can do it. My thing with Santander is that just, he doesn't get on base. Like, yeah, he can hit you 20 home runs, 20 doubles every single year if he's healthy, but the on base percentage is, is so low. It's, it's a league average WRC plus every year minus, you know, uh, that short 2020 sample. Um, so it, he's a fantastic story. Rule five pick to legitimate major leaguer. But I, I just, I see him getting squeezed out here at, at some point. I think you can find, uh, get more value out of some of these other guys who are closer to the major leagues down the road. Yeah. Uh, Santander is who he is at this point. He's, he's like you said, around a league average bat. And he's not going to get on base. He's going to hit for power. Question is how high does his average get? And that's almost based on batting average for balls in play. As long as he can get in better shape the way he came into this year, maybe his defense could be better than it was last year, but he could be valuable to a team other than the Orioles more than he can be to the Orioles. Because like you said, we got Robert Newsham, we got Kyle Stowers, Houston Neil Diaz now, redemption tour underway. So Zach Watson even. So yeah, we're just so deep at outfield that I think it would be, but it's only a matter of time before he's moved because how long are you going to keep him around to just, clog up right field and DH at a league average rate when you have guys that could potentially be better than that if you give them the chance. That does it for the survey. Thank you to Brandon and our Patreon group for uh, putting that together. Remember, you can join our Patreon group for as little as $3 a month. Um, And we've got some things planned for the regular season that are pretty exciting. And we've got some big stuff planned for the coming week here at On the Birds. First off, we are recording an interview later this week with Brad Siolik the director of pro scouting with the Baltimore Orioles. That will not be live, but we will have details coming out later this week. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at BSL on the Verge for updates on when that interview is going to drop. And next Monday, we will be back with our live show, which is not only going to be about opening day predictions, but before we get into that, we're going to be joined by John Mayo at MLB Pipeline to go over really one of the last big lists of the offseason to cover not just the Orioles farm system, the top 100 prospects in baseball. So we look forward to talking with him next week. And we're talking to Brad Seolik uh, in a few days here. So be sure to check out that and check out BaltimoreSportsAndLife.com for all the latest covers, including Bob's off-season improvements series with Zach Peake and John Rhodes, as well as other coverage of the Orioles, Ravens, college sports, and more. Be sure to hop on the message board there 
and join the discussion with fellow readers and writers on the site. So before we wrap up, Bob, Nick, it's been a busy show. Any final thoughts? Just today was a lot of fun getting a good sneak peek of some of these young prospects in that game. Uh, definitely if, you know, the, the future is bright over here, we say many, many times. Um, and if you want to come hang out with an amazing group of, of other patrons who are equally as excited uh, and find joy in these fourth and, and fifth string catchers deep down in the minor leagues, if, if you're one of us, you're one of us sickos, uh, come join us, join that Patreon. Uh, it's it's fun. And like Zach said, a lot of plans. I, I want to buy tickets for Patreon members to get out to minor league games. We want to do live shows uh, with Patreon members only, watching games with patrons, uh, having conversations with, with everybody in there. So come join. It's, it's a lot of fun. Yep. I'm excited to talk to Brad later this week. I'm excited for opening day next week uh, for the minor leagues and the major leagues. I'm excited to get back to our daily content on the Patreon where we're recapping all the minor league game action from the night before. I'm excited for some live streams. I'm, I'm just excited. That's the word of the day. Couldn't agree more. So uh, we're excited for what's coming up here in the 2022 season. Uh, for Bob Phil and Nick Stevens, this is Zach Spedden. You've been listening to On the Verge. Most of us have clothes we've loved for years, but it's harder than ever to find clothing that stands the test of time. So for your summer closet update, shop American Giant. From hoodies and t-shirts to denim and more, you can build a wardrobe to be proud of for summers to come. Shop Lifetime Essentials at American-Giant.com and get 20% off with code LT23 at checkout. That's 20% off at American-Giant.com, promo code LT23. For the ones who get it done, the most important part is the one you need now. And the best partner is the one who can deliver. That's why millions of maintenance and repair pros trust Granger, Because we have professional-grade supplies for every industry, even hard-to-find products. And we have same-day pickup and next-day delivery on most orders. But most importantly, we have an unwavering commitment to help keep you up and running. Call, click Grainger.com, or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. When you earn your degree online at Arizona State University, you get everything the nation's most innovative university has to offer. The same internationally recognized faculty, the same nationally ranked programs, the same degree. Learn more at asuonline.asu.edu.